John Keeler with his family runs a 4,000 acre property in the Western Districts of Victoria and he runs a primarily meat sheep flock with a few cattle and a couple of other experiments thrown in. John has been a long term proponent of breed planning and I'm talking to him today about his experience in the meat sheep industry and where he's seen genetics come from and where he's seen them going to. This is a fascinating story of someone who is pioneering traits in the meat sheep industry that look not only at the top performance traits but also welfare standards. John, how are you today, mate? Very good. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> Today's video is brought to you by Davos Fencing Clip. Designed, manufactured and owned in Australia, this innovative little clip makes repairing or building fences super easy. For timber, steel or plastic posts, follow the link in the description to get yours today. John, thanks very much for having us out to the farm. Can you give us a little bit of a summary of your operation here, size, number of views and what you're doing? Um, we run about uh, 1,600 hectares here, about 4,000 acres. There's about 7,000 adult ewes on the farm each year and about 3,500 ewe lambs. So we join about 10,000 females, um, producing around 13 to 14,000 lambs a year. There's 100 cows, um, twinning cows, producing about 120 calves a year. Um, there's 1,000 ra 1, rams that we grow through and sell to people from... Uh, southern Australia from Kangaroo Island to northern New South Wales and the bottom of Tassie and everywhere in between. So that's pretty well it. It's a high rainfall area, 830 millimetres, quite high stocking rates around 20 to 22 DSE to the hectare um, with a nice wet winter climate for 100 mils of rain through the winter months and about uh, 25 mil of rain through the summer months, quite constant and a good, a good farming environment. Now, your family has been chasing traits for a very long time. You've been innovators in the space, particularly with meat sheep. When did you transition across from dual purpose to meat sheep? Um, we moved basically from buying our ewes in in the late 80s, early 90s into the Coopworths. And then we've been at the forefront of, tra of transforming Coopworth animals into composite animals. Just um, measuring as we go, looking around, finding... I guess the family lines that had the right balance of characteristics, of traits that we wanted, and they could have come from any of the other white wool breeds in Australia. So there's been um, Pole Dorset, there's been White Suffolk, there's been Border Leicester, there's East Frisian, there's Finns, there's Texels, there's numerous breeds that have gone into our, our animals. I guess simplistically, the animals are now a, a fast growing white sheep with two lambs. And this is an important point. You don't believe in breeds per se. You believe in performance and economic value, don't you? And you had a great lesson from Professor Coop um, on that early on in your career, didn't you? Yeah, that's, that's really the case. The dollar wins in the end and the animals have to keep delivering for economic reason. Um, so we make a dollar. They need to certainly do it from an environmental point of view, from a welfare, a low... Um, a low parasite, um, a good outcome from a welfare point of view, and also um, if you have that, it's good for people too. So I guess you get the triple bottom line, that's how we really have it. Our animals are fun animals to have, they constantly try to do the right thing for you. They're trying to stay alive, they're trying to have easy lambs, they're trying to look after their lambs, they bounce back in hard times. Very, very resilient, rewarding animals to have because I guess they're the survivors of a difficult situation. What captured your mind? I mean, you've, you've really gone into the genetics of your flock and you spent a lot of time on the computer working in lamb plan, which is the system that you use to manage your flock. What really drove your interest into the genetics? What captivated you? Curiosity. Yeah? Just, yeah, people would say, why do you do it? And I'd just say, well, I'm curious. Um, without a doubt, I'm curious. I've had very good support. There's been um, two people who um, have very large intellects and have been very generous with their time. So Leo Cummins, a retired DPI researcher from Hamilton. Leo, um, Leo's got the ability, you could ask him a question, he could tell you who wrote the paper and where it was written, in which journal and the question that, and the answer that they didn't answer. And the other one was Rob Banks, who um, was the one, the person who put together the start of land plan. So I've been very lucky to have access to a couple of outstanding mentors 
that have allowed me to ask questions and, and, and get answers and, and sort of gave me a direction where to go. So I've been very thankful for that. And as a result, your stud is sort of on the forefront of using genetic data in your flock management, aren't you? Yeah, we've, um, we've been able to expand the stud. We've been able to record a large amount of traits, including of some novel traits. Um, we've been at the forefront of um, getting those developed into new breeding values that the whole industry uses. We've got a large data set, um, a very large data set, um, that is used for research that's extended back out through various national programs. And we've been comfortable enough to, I guess, put some of our en energies back out to industry. So um, I guess we've I've always been a, a giver rather than a taker. I don't mind being a giver. I've always got more than I've ever, more back than I've ever given. So I always thought that worked well for me. Now you're on the cusp at the moment, you're explaining to me off camera of seeing the sire database mixed with the maternal database and being able to map all of those animals together with a few outliers on the fringes. Where do you see genetic knowledge moving into the next five to ten years in sheep breeding what what are, what, are, what is the most exciting thing that you see coming in sheep breeding so in 2025 we'll have the terminal side database in australia um, mixed into the maternal database um, and we'll get some breeding values that are straight out of there um, associated or hooked up with some uh, some snips with some genomic information that'll be a new frontier because what we then can do with more accuracy is, as a maternal breeder, we can go anywhere in Australia and find the, the traits we want from any of the animals we want. So that'll be the first part that goes about that. We'll then have better accuracy. The accuracies of our breeding values will go higher, and that will mean that our selection decisions, as all are, will be more right than less right, because it's not about black and white, this is about shades of grey. So you only have to think in, in shades of grey. We're just trying to be more right than less right. So genetic gain will go up. So we'll then be able to, I guess, deliver lamb product to customers that is better quality again. It's very, very good already, but it will get better again faster, which means that then more people will like eating lamb and more people will want sheep, etc., etc. Um, and that'll go across all the traits we've got. We'll be much more ready to quickly react to change market signals and that's the strength of composite sheep. Always the strength is rather than just breeding within a breed and then slowly moving your animals across, you quickly go, you find out what the market wants, you go and get what you want and, and you incorporate it. it in and within the next year you've got it and you're up and travelling and so the strength of the whole process is composite sheep in that way and that, if you think of it, really just mirrors a natural system of DNA, how it's constantly moved and pushed, you know, in a wild situation by the environment. So all we're doing is recreating a normal, natural system, not a restricted system, but we're actually recreating the system that allows things to move to the place that needs to quickly. Now, because you think outside of the box and you're an innovator, you see some easy gains with sheep genomics now too. Tell me a little bit about how you're chasing tail length and how you think that's such an easy get. Well, many of the traits we've dealt with for so long require huge databases which take a lot of cost and time and effort to do and they've got low heritability traits. So, so low, in, low, low chance of getting what you want is what yeah, you're saying when you're talking about a her heritability trait. It's like you know a 1 in 10 or a 1 in 20. So heritability is what's passed from generation to generation. So things like reproduction have got a you having two lambs have got so much noise around them that you only make you don't, when you measure two lambs, you don't know why. Why did she have that? Was it luck? Was it chance? Was it environment? Was it something different? Yeah, yeah. So it's hard to make changes. It's hard to link that trait to a particular suite of genes. Yeah, it's suite of genes. Where other traits are much in the middle part, uh, fleece weight and micron and early growth, they're not too bad, they're in the middle. But the interesting one is that um, tail length, if we wanted to take tails off sheep, it's quite highly inherited. It's about 0.55 to about 0.8. So it's, it's arguably the, the highest trait that we've ever measured for transmission from generation to generation. So really what happens is it's towards the stage where a lamb has a tail length halfway between its mother and its father. 
And so you're talking about the end of docking within a few years' time and potentially lower arthritis rates in carcasses of lambs as well. So we, in a national situation, if we had a national imperative to take tails off, she off sheep, we could do it very easily. If we wanted to do other things that would take us long decades and decades, we could take tails off sheep very easily if we wanted to. Um, and there's some very good welfare outcomes from that because just the act of docking lambs, um, it creates a wound on a newborn lamb in, uh, in, a, in a young lamb, a six or eight week old lamb in a muddy environment sometimes, and there's bacterial infection, which causes some risk of arthritis and then also some at, at clinical level and also at subclinical you can have lower carcass weights of consignments of lambs so there's some positive gains to be had there because there's been studies haven't there on on tail length versus arthritis in carcass and there's been a definite correlation as well as also carcass weight that's correct so um Tail length, the, the recommendation is three, three claudal joints out so, um, and to the tip of the vulva. That's what industry recommendation is. But even, even um, at, at that level, there's always the risk of a wound on, a, on an animal in an environment. So if you could do without that, yeah, you could, pick up some, you could pick up some survival, you could pick up some reduced arthritis in lambs and you could pick up some carcass weight in consignments. So um, that's just one of the, the many, I guess, welfare welfare characteristics or t welfare traits out there that we could work on and that would be an easy one to work on. Five years out, where are you? Um, we'll, we'll, we will have consolidated the terminal maternal database, we'll be making better genetic gains, um, we'll be delivering better quality carcasses to customers, we'll probably have some more weight, uh, intramuscular fat and tenderness in our animals here. Um, we're always we're already at the end, at the very pointy end of parasite um, resistance in this flock. Our maternal flocks, the um, arguably the most parasite resistant flock in the country, um, and parasites. If you look at all the diseases that sheep are challenged with over time, parasites uh, just make everything else pale into insignificance. In it. And so they're very very important. Um, I think. By the time we get to five years out, we'll probably have some welfare traits starting to push down into, um, into our animals. And then one that I guess we need to talk about will be methane. Um, we're involved in the national methane data collection process, which will happen in May 24, which is nearly here now. And that'll involve us putting sheep through packs, uh, uh, passive accumula accumulation mm -hmm. containers and we'll be uh, chambers. Like little ovens. Little ovens for about an hour. They just yeah. go in They're not there. ovens. They don't heat yeah. them up. It's they're, okay. Yeah, they're just little, little, a little, little unit. They stand next to their friend. You just take a uh, methane reading and an oxygen reading. You'll take a reading out of um, their, their rumen for some fauna, fauna and flora. Um, Australia's got a plan in place to test about 10,000 sheep in the next four years. That will probably by five years time we'll have that up and we'll be up and running by then and we'll have methane written into our selection indexes which um, has the potential to reduce methane outputs by about one percent per year from our ruminants um, and that is a good thing because loss of methane is basically loss of energy mm. and loss of energy is loss of performance. Because methane is produced by flora in the rumen that actually consume the energy that the animal would otherwise mm. use. Yeah. yeah, so we'll have more efficient animals and so um, that's an interesting space to be involved in. Um, you know, look forward to finding out which animals on this, on this property are actually the efficient ones. High growth rate, um, low parasites, high reproduction, good quality eating, um, nice intramuscular fat, tender, um, methane, low methane, welfare traits. And so we just keep building the picture right across the, the spectrum of many traits you can measure on a sheep and taking it to the economic sweet spot, the dollar spot, good for people, good for customers, good for the environment, good for the economics. Triple bottom line. Triple bottom line. Now, John, when you're breeding to performance, you're not breeding to visual traits, are you? You're breeding to the dollar, and everything's measured by the dollar? That's, yeah, that's right, Tim. Um, we're, all, we're all driven by economics, and so rather than get up in the morning and think we need to make them look like this and make them look like that, what we really need is we make the, need to make them perform like we need. It gets 
quite difficult when you're dealing with many traits to then decide when you look at an animal and there's 10 or 15 columns of information um, where to make the compromise. And so you, the geneticists sit down and they look at the traits, they, they put an economic value, a relative economic value for each trait, and then they proportionally allocate a part of that to a mathematical equation which gives you an index. So it's much easier to use index selection because you're getting assistance in balancing out or averaging out some of the traits. You would find situations where you may wish to fix a certain characteristic in a flock and so you would then just go and use single trait selection. After you've got that corrected you would then go and take a more balanced approach with an index approach. So that's pretty common across animal species around the world. John, thanks very much for your time here today, mate. We're going to be doing more with John. We're going to have a look at a new breed of sheep that he is pioneering called the nudie sheep. Look out for that video in the coming weeks. John, thanks very much for your time, mate. Thank you. Very welcome.